Welcome to module three for SPED 738. In this module, we wanna look at partnerships with families and kind of what that looks like in your role as a special educator, things that you can do to foster a good partnership with families and resources that are available for parents that are helpful for you to know about. Now in your program uh, through Pitt State, you will take a course in family partnerships, which really covers a lot more of this in detail, but some of the things I want to touch base on from the chapter is how can we foster participation in the IEP, because that's so important in our team effort with parents. Um, touching on how to facilitate with friendships, looking at circle of friends, which is uh, something that your text uh, talks about. One of the key areas that parents struggle with is homework at home and some things that we can do um, as teachers to help with that process. And then look specifically at some advocating and resources that are available in Kansas that are helpful for you to know about or available in the Midwest that would help parents that you're working with if they need resources outside of school. Just some key things when we're thinking about partnerships with families that I want us to keep in mind and things that really help us foster that great working relationship that we have with parents is, is having communication. Communicating with parents frequently about how their student is doing at school, what they're working on, uh, how they're making progress towards their goals, um, being clear in your communication, you know, making it uh, communication that parents can understand without a lot of special ed jargon, and being friendly uh, with, with parents as you talk to them. I think one of the things that really plays into uh, having a successful partnership is really respecting families, treating families with dignity. I think what we have to uh, keep in mind and take the family's perspective is a lot of times uh, these are tough situations that we're involved in with families. You know, they have a child who's struggling, who's not making progress. Um, sometimes they're just being identified and so parents are grappling with that whole issue of you know, what is, what is going to happen to their child um, who is um, struggling and getting that diagnosis. And then really affirming strength. So really seeing the positive in their, in their child and being able to, to point out to them those strengths that their child has, to see those as a teacher and see that their, their child has worth, their child has things they're bringing to your classroom that are helpful to your classroom. And then when we talk about commitment, just really being sensitive to the parents' emotional needs, um, being accessible to parents when they have questions that you know, you're communicating with them um, and, and responding in a timely manner when they have questions. You know, being sensitive to emotional needs. I think sometimes um, it's easy as a teacher to not necessarily um, connect with what the parents are dealing with at home. And that's just because you know, you're not in that home, you're not seeing the challenges that they're facing, but raising a child with special needs can be really challenging. It can put a lot of pressure on parents. And we know from research that parents of children with special needs go through a grieving process similar to parents who lose a child. And sometimes they go through that grieving process more than once during their child's lifetime. You know, they may go through that grieving process during identification process, they may also go through that gr those grieving stages when school starts getting really hard and once again they're reminded of their child's disability. And so just being sensitive to their emotional needs um, and the pressures that they face um, raising a child with special needs is really helpful as we build that partnership with them. Trust, you know, it's all about maintaining confidentiality. They need to know that, you know, the communication that you're sharing with them is confidential. Um, that you're not talking about their child um, in ways that are not confidential with other teachers or outside of the school environment. Um, you know, being reliable on, on how you're working with their child, and that, that all comes back to communication too. And so these are just some things to remember as you're really developing those relationships with parents as you work with their child. These are all things that as you put in the work ahead of time and you really develop uh, this partnership that it's going to help down the road maybe when you get into a challenging situation with an IEP or um, you know you're having some challenging conversations about placement 
when things like trust and communication and respect are already built into that partnership, it makes those conversations easier. I'll give you an example, a personal example uh, for me, um, raising a child with special needs with Josie. Just this morning I left a meeting where we were talking about placement. And we were really looking at Josie now in third grade. Third grade's getting harder. Um, she's falling further behind. She's needing a lot of pull out when she's at our neighborhood building compared to when she's at the school for the deaf, working with her deaf peers. And so, you know, is that beneficial? Is it is it detrimental to her for that pull out? Well, we have a great working relationship with her team at our neighborhood building. Uh, they communicate with us frequently. Um, they understand the challenges that we have with Josie even at home. They understand what our goals are for Josie. You know, we're looking 30 years down the line, what do we want Josie to be able to do? And sometimes that means we make hard decisions now in terms of her placement because we may need to do math pull out uh, more frequently than in the classroom because we know we really need her to have those math skills to be successful and independent. But we also know that social skills are really important for her. So, you know, that's high on the priority list. How do we give her those experiences and what are some things academically we can let slide because we're focusing on social skill development. So those conversations are tough for us as parents because we're realizing how delayed she is in our learning. But at the same time, we feel very comfortable being honest with her team on what our hopes are. We know that they respect um, those goals that we have for Josie. They understand where we're coming from. Um, they're sensitive to, to those needs. And so as a team, we came to a great conclusion on how to modify her schedule and make it work better for her this year. You know, if, if we didn't have that good working relationship with them, if we felt like maybe they didn't listen to us, they didn't value our opinion about Josie being her parents, or if they just weren't communicating clearly with us and all of a sudden this popped up and we weren't even expecting it, um, you know, those all play a part in how successful that meeting is going to be. And that really wasn't an IEP meeting we were having to reevaluate our IEP or anything like that. That was just a meeting that we typically have uh, for Josie at the beginning of the year. A couple weeks in, let's see, is this working or, or not working? And, and what kinds of changes do we need to make? Um, that all is successful because we've spent time developing those relationships with the teachers, the specialists, and they have done the same with us, um, kind of following these steps. And so it really is beneficial um, for you to put in the time to develop those relationships. Just some tips for collaborating on IEP. You know, IEPs can be, they can be stressful for us as special educators, right? Because um, we're bringing to the table a lot of evaluation we've done. Uh, maybe the students haven't made the progress we were hoping they would make. We're talking about goals for the next year. Sometimes there are changes in placement. Uh, there's transitions we need to talk about. It can be stressful for us um, from a teacher's pr perspective, right, a related service perspective. It also can be really stressful for parents, especially parents who are not familiar with special education, really don't know how it works exactly. So there are some things that we can do ahead of time. One is asking about family preferences for meetings. So just making sure that that meeting time, as much as you can within your, your schedule and your school day, kind of meet at a time that's convenient for parents. Um, provide information ahead of time. This is so important. It's really hard for parents to come into an IEP meeting and not have seen a, even a draft of the IEP or maybe not have seen the evaluation that's been conducted, not have an idea of what goals we're thinking about. You know, the meeting is going to be much more successful if parents can take a look at a draft IEP ahead of time. The important point to make with them is that it is a draft. IEP, that is the IEP team as a whole, who they're an important part of, that's going to make that a final IEP. Making sure the evaluation is complete and results are clearly synthesized ahead of time. This is so important. We don't want to walk into an IEP meeting where we don't have all the evaluation completed. Or, I'll be honest, I've received a draft IEP before that had two years before evaluation information or had evaluation information with another student's name on it. That immediately makes me feel unsure about the team being able to meet my child's needs because there's inaccurate information in the IEP. They were kind of hurrying to get us a draft and 
you know, I'm re I as a parent wasn't really worried about that date that the IEP had to be done. So what I did is I contacted the school and said, hey, I'll sign whatever we need to sign to, to lengthen out the date of when the IEP needs to be revised. Let's get this right and have an IEP meeting when we have all the information. And so we, we delayed that meeting for a couple weeks, gave the team more time to do the testing that they needed and make sure we had a really good draft IEP before we met. It's also helpful, especially for parents who are new to the process, to send them an agenda. Kind of give them an idea. This is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the evaluation results. Talk about where your student's currently performing. Then we're going to talk as a group about what are our goals for the next year and get your feedback on that. Give them an idea of what the meeting's going to look like. If placement or service changes are going to be suggested, prepare the parents ahead of time. This is really important because these are the kinds of things that create anxiety for parents. For example, if you're going to drop speech and language services or OT services, let the parents know ahead of time and explain why those changes, they're suggesting those changes occur. <clears throat> Last year we dropped uh, PT, OT, and speech, all three related services at the end of the year during Josie's three-year evalu evaluation. And all three of those related service uh, folks called me ahead of time, kind of explained to me where Josie had been making progress and why they felt like pull-out for those services just wasn't warranted anymore. I really appreciated that. And by the time we got into the meeting and we went through that portion of the IEP, it was very easy for my husband and I to say, yes, we agree with that. We completely understand why that decision needs to be made, and we agree with it. And it uh, also reduced the time that we were sitting there uh, in a meeting. Avoiding educational jargon. I know we all know this, but man, it's so easy to slide into to using this. I even do it with my husband now when we're talking about, you know, preparing for Josie's IEP meeting. I start using acronyms for things. He's not used to the education world. He doesn't understand those, so he can get lost really quick. So it's just an important thing to just kind of keep in the back of your mind that you don't want to use those jargon words. <clears throat> The other thing that's really helpful as we develop IEPs is to ask parents to share their priorities, their hopes, and their concerns. Typically, we get a questionnaire before the IEP meeting that we fill out and, and send back, just allowing us to kind of document what those things are. It helps you as an IEP team understand what the parent's goals are. It kind of helps you frame some goals at school that can help meet those. Um, also lets you know what some concerns are. So even for us, sometimes we have behavioral issues at home that we have addressed in that questionnaire, and then the OT or the PT has been able to help us with those. Or even like some independent living skills. For example, Josie uh, is pretty low muscle tone, so she's pretty weak, and dressing herself is a really hard thing, or zipping her jacket, buttoning a shirt. Those are really hard things for her, but that affects our life at home that she can't do those things independently. It's also going to affect her down the road, right? So that one year I wrote that on our questionnaire and the OT said, hey, let's let's write a goal for this. This is a life skill we can work on at school. So that's kind of a good example of how you can pull information from that and plug it into the IEP and just to make that IEP more universal. <clears throat> also, when you know, when we talk about placement services, really discussing the benefits and the drawbacks of those things is really important. In the meeting that we had today, we were looking at pull out pretty much for half a day. And so for Josie, and so we looked at, gosh, what are the benefits of that? Well, we get to really focus on those academic skills, right? And she is making progress on those with that really specific one-on-one -on -one, uh, work. But what are the drawbacks? Well, she's not watching her peers in the classroom. She's not interacting with her peers. Um, you know, so we really had to honestly lay out kind of the benefits and the drawbacks to make, be able to make a good decision on her schedule. Um, same thing with related services. You know, we will have students that will always benefit from speech and language services, and when we have to weigh, can that happen in the classroom? Does that have to be done in pullout? If it's done in pullout, what is that student missing in the general ed classroom, and how's that going to impact them? Because it will. It will impact them down the line. You just have to be honest with parents about that and just paint a really good picture of what the pros and cons are for those things. This is just a brief look at some of the tips that your textbook talked about. Um, 
and there's lots of other ways that we can collaborate on IEPs. I really hope that you take a closer look at that and look at what the authors uh, discussed and offered in that because it, it really can be helpful in terms of having productive, successful IEP meetings. One more thing I will say on tips for collaborating on IEPs. Um, we work with a number of families here in the Kansas City area through a support group that we have um, at our church that are raising children with special needs. A number of our families say when they go into the IEP meeting, they, they tell the team, hey, we're not going to sign the IEP today. It does not mean we disagree. We just want to be able to take it with us and think on it before we officially sign on it. And I think that is a good thing for teams to keep in mind and also know that that is not saying that the parents think you're not doing your job well. It just means they're trying to cover their bases and make sure they really understand and that they're not just signing their name because we're asking them to sign for permission to implement the IEP. So I know it's easy and I, as a special educator, I would feel a little uncomfortable if parents were saying that thinking, man, do they want to change something on the IEP or are we going to have another meeting in a week and they're going to, they're going to have changes they want to make to placement or services. Um, oftentimes it's just to give them time to process it. It's a lot of information for them to take in. The text talks about facilitating friendships with circle of friends and so I just wanted to play a brief video here for you to see how Wichita Public Schools uses circle of friends within their middle school and high school programs and it's a great um, it's a great way to see how this is implemented and the impact it can have on students. and I'm a member of Circle of Friends at Southeast High School. This is my friend Floyd, and this is my friend Catherine. I've been part of Circle of Friends for two years. Circle of Friends is a fantastic opportunity for you to be a part of a unique group that's not like any other. Circle of Friends pairs regular ed students with special ed students as mentors and friends. We participate in regular classroom activities, field trips, and even lunch dates. This gave me a chance to get to know a group of people that I probably wouldn't have gotten to know otherwise. Circle of Friends also creates and fosters an environment of tolerance and acceptance throughout our school. Circle of Friends helps both of our, our groups of students, our regular and our special education students. Our special education students are so welcomed. They are a part of our family. They don't stick out. They are just integrated totally into our building. It's just been a real benefit for, for both parties. I think our regular ed kids are getting so much more than what they ever anticipated by being a part of this group, um, wanting to show them love and care and support. At Robinson, we have a very strong Circle of Friends program, and it continues to grow and get bigger each year. I think the benefits have been not only to our special, special needs kids, but to our regular kids as well. Kids have fostered some friendships that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise, and it's opened their eyes to a whole new world and a whole new set of friends. Like we wouldn't have met all these uh, fun kids if it weren't for Circle of Friends, and so I'm really thankful that they made a, a program. Um, McKenna's a really fun girl, she's really sweet. and. I love to play with her at recess, and um, she was really fun to be around, and she's a great friend. It's, a, it's really fun if you like to be with a lot of people. Yeah, we like field trips. I like to be in the same group, and like last year with the skating, we got to skate with each other. I know more of skating. Rebecca oh. fell a few times. Have a wonderful time with them and teach them, and actually, sometimes they even teach us, so it's a really cool experience. They're really, really nice, so it's fun to talk with them and see like what they like, what they like to do, and um, then they get to also meet us and see what kind of things we like. I really like being able to form a friendship with McKenna, it's been really nice to get to know her. It's so successful because we have so many people who believe in the program. Um, our sponsors, 
work really hard to make sure all of our kids get matches and we have kids who really want to get involved here at Robinson and they've taken the time to see Circle of Friends as, as a program they want to be involved in. And by uh, some of our leaders getting involved, it gets kids excited and everybody wants to be part of it. I would encourage other schools to get involved and to uh, get a group together and just try it and don't be afraid. You don't have to go great big your first year. Start small and experiment a little bit. Find what works for your school and your schedule and then grow it from there. I don't think there is one of our special needs kids or one of our regular ed kids that don't get some kind of joy when they see each other. Um, and it's knowing that we both have so much to offer um, to each other and it's just that care, that genuine care and respect for them as a person. gives you an idea of what Circle of Friends looks like within a school setting. It's a uh, program where you start a chapter in your district and they provide training to you. They provide kind of the procedures for how you develop those friendship groups and steps that um, take place to foster those friendship groups. Just a really good program if that's something that your district is interested in or your building is interested in that I would encourage you to look into. It does help when you have kind of a, a program that you can follow that really guides you effectively, especially one like this that is really uh, built on research to develop those great friendships with students um, with disabilities and their typical developing peers. So a couple of things on homework. I love that the textbook covers homework because man, homework can be tough for parents and uh, even in elementary school it can be a challenge. So. You know, these kids uh, that we're working with, school is just hard for them. Most of them, it's hard, right? They get home from school, they're tired. Their brains are zapped. Either they've been trying to rein in their behaviors, right, and have good behaviors in the classroom, or their academic work is just really hard and taxing and wears them out. So I think it's good to just keep that in mind with parents. You know, I think looking at homework as a way to keep parents engaged in what's going on at school, and also really fostering um, things like reading outside of the school day, reading for enjoyment. Those are important things with homework. But, but giving students a lot of homework, where it's overwhelming, where it's wearing them out, um, not being cognizant of the fact that they are really tired when they get home, those are all can be kind of detrimental to home life and what parents are trying to do at home uh, with their kiddos with special needs. So just a couple things I wanted to point out related to the text about homework guidelines that I think is really helpful. You know, having homework that's purposeful, that's not just worksheets that you want them to fill out um, to continue the days of learning, having it be really purposeful. For example, working on spelling words and having, you know, five, 10 minutes where they practice those words a day or um, finishing up on a writing project maybe they're already working on. Maybe they've written the work, taking it home to edit it with parents' help would be a great way to have purposeful homework. <clears throat> and then reading, of course, is always purposeful, right? Because we want our students to be successful readers. And so the only way we're successful readers is with practice. So really having that practice time. Um, ownership. I think it's really good for students to have an understanding of the homework, to know how to do it independently um, as much as they can, right? And for it to be engaging to them, okay? Not to be too hard uh, for them to complete. Kind of gets back to competence too. It should be something that's already been taught, not something new that they're just learning how to do. Um, you know, if they're working on maybe new math skills that are new, maybe have them do some homework that builds on those skills, okay? That, uh, for example, if we're doing uh, addition uh, with caring, maybe just working on basic addition skills as just a reminder during homework, okay? The other thing that I think is really important to help parents with homework is kind of outline maybe some accommodations they can make for their child. 
So, um, give you an idea of some things we've done in our house. Josie gets regular third grade homework. It comes home on Monday and it goes back on Friday. And it's the homework that all students in third grade do. It's typically a reading passage with some comprehension questions. And then it's a math worksheet of something that they're currently working on. Well, for her, since she does pull out that math worksheet, usually pretty hard. So we do an accommodation. She does it with a calculator and with our assistants. And she kind of likes that because she wants to know what the general classroom is doing. It's not something she could do independently, but it also allows us to work on those calculator skills. <clears throat> and that's okay with the teacher. On the reading passage, um, sometimes we highlight the vocabulary words in it for her. Or um, if it's a written answer that they're looking for, they'll let me write it for her. Since we're low muscle tone and writing is really hard for us, her hands are pretty tired at the end of the day. And so we kind of have to look at what do they want. Well, they want her to be reading that passage and comprehending it. Not really worried about her writing necessarily, right? Not homework assignment. So it's okay for us to write for her. <clears throat> I think it's really helpful for parents if you can kind of lay out some accommodations for them because they may not be sure how they can make changes to the assignment. To, to be a little bit more conducive for what their child can do. So give them some ideas of things they can do. It's always helpful. Um, even working on like spelling words, some things they can do that maybe are a little different. Like for example, Josie doesn't really want to write her words three times each to help her remember them because it's hard for her to write them. And so we actually send them in an email to the teacher. So she types them, sends the teacher an email so she sees that she's been interacting with those words working on it, okay? So just kind of think about some accommodations depending on what age of student you work with, and that's kind of a good um, guide to give parents is just some, some assistance in that. I want to talk about advocacy a little bit because I know typically your job is going to be about academics, right, and about behavior at school and working on those things. But one of the things uh, that can be really helpful to parents is kind of point them in a direction of resources outside of school. So I want to point out some that are available in Kansas that may be um, helpful to parents. One is Parenting Children with Special Needs. This is a publication that's published once a month um, out of a group from Kansas City called Parenting Children with Special Needs. It's a magazine, but they also have a blog and they have a resource guide for different areas. So they've got one for Kansas City. This is just a great resource. Typically they have a story about a family and kind of how they've maybe overcome um, a disability or how they've worked with schools or if they have a, a medical issue how they've navigated that and then it'll have different information about camps that kids can attend usually has information about education so maybe um, some ideas about IEPs or uh, information about financial planning so how do we plan for these kiddos for the long term so that they have the resources that they need this is just a really great resource. There's lots of information on their website, but it's also a good thing for parents to subscribe to um, and um, get that in the mail once a month. Kind of makes them feel more connected with other families um, of children with special needs. Whoops. I'll get back there. Families Together is an organization that's been in Kansas for a long time. They provide all kinds of things for parents. Um, for example, they provide training for parents. Um, they have an information center that parents can access that provides one-on-one -on -one assistance if they need it, provides lots of resources for building those family school partnerships. Uh, they also provide advocates for working with schools if families need that. Um, just a really good connection for families that I would suggest uh, you look into. Sometimes they also have resources for siblings of children with special needs and ways for them to get connected. So if you feel like parents are kind of feeling like they're out on an island and they need to be connected with some other parents like them, this is a great place uh, to send them. Uh, you'll notice right now they're getting ready for an employment awareness training. It's two-day training for parents on how to help your child be employable as they move out of high school. So lots of different things that they do uh, for parents with children with special needs. The next resource is a grant program out of the Kansas Department of Education called the Parent Information uh, Resource Center. This is an awesome resource. And the folks that coordinate this are 
very knowledgeable on how to help families. So if you have a family that's struggling to find resources, that maybe they're struggling at home to work with their child, um, this is a great place to send them. This also provides training for schools. So if your school would like to, to get um, some different uh, skills in getting families engaged in what's going on at school, they'll come in and provide training for you. I'll tell you, the folks that are involved in this are really, really good. Um, they've been doing it for a while. They know how to connect parents to all kinds of resources within their community, wherever they are in the state. And so this is one that I would really encourage you to take a look at. The other thing that I'd like to point out is the idea of respite care for parents. Um, you know, I think one of the challenging things for our parents is while their child is at school, typically most of them are working, right? And then when their child gets home with special needs, they typically have, they require a lot of, of time from parents. It can often be stressful for parents. If they have behaviors that are challenging, parents don't get a break from those behaviors. And it can really be detrimental to the health of the family unit if parents don't get a break. And one of the things that's becoming more popular is providing respite care for parents of children with special needs. So the other thing that we always kind of have to consider with these parents is a lot of them it's not that easy to get a babysitter. You know, if you think about it, if you have a child with, who's on the autism spectrum that has pretty significant behavior issues or, uh, for example, we have a child that's too fed and is nonverbal and deaf, you know, that's not really a kid that you can just call up a high school student and have them come over and babysit. So you get an hour or two uh, away. And so there are some programs now that are being developed <clears throat> that have been in practice for a while that provide respite care for parents. In the Kansas City area, there are a number of churches that do this now. Uh, Grace Church is the largest. They have a program called SOAR. And they'll have about 150 individuals with disabilities, that's including adults uh, with disabilities, come and they provide free child care for three hours on a Friday night. And then the siblings actually go to a different program, but also have free child care uh, for three hours so parents can go out. Um, our church does this. We started a program like this at uh, my church, my husband and I did. And um, we will have parents go out and they'll buy a car during that time. Or, They'll go out and look at houses because they're, they're in transitioning between homes or apartments. And it's really hard for them to go do that uh, with their child with special needs. Um, sometimes we have parents come and they actually go to counseling during that time, um, <clears throat> which is great for them to be able to do that and not have that childcare cost or know that their child is in the hands of someone who is trained to deal with their disability. Another new kind of initiative in the Kansas City area is a place called Emma's Place and this is a place that provides child care for um, children uh, with disabilities. They provide child care in the summer so if your child is out of summer school you need a place for them to go. <clears throat> they have trained and licensed folks that work with kids with special needs at this place. They also have evening and after school uh, care so it's really exciting to me to see some of these really specific to children with disabilities programs popping up that are providing parents with respite, providing them with an alternative um, for child care because, you know, the pressures that these parents are under are pretty significant. I mean, if you think about, <clears throat> and we were just having this conversation about Josie today, talking about let's do some further testing because we need to um, get her on a waiver system. So when she reaches 18, she's going to have some resources in place. Well, then you start looking at, you know, financially, what kinds of supports is she going to need over the course of her lifetime? You know, and how do we, how do we take account for that? How do we put money away for that? Um, how do we know she's going to be well taken care of when we're gone? There's a lot of pressures that these parents are feeling and so it's really good if we can kind of point them in some directions to get that respite care and get them a break. Um, it's really healthy for them to have that time. So this kind of covers partnerships with families in a really really brief nutshell. 
Uh, but I look forward to kind of getting, seeing your thoughts as we get into the discussion on kind of how, you're, how you've interacted with families, some things that you've pulled from the chapter that you think if you uh, implement would really help you develop your partnerships better, um, some concerns that you have working with families. And so I look forward to that. And like I said, you will learn more throughout your program here at Pitt on working with families.